it is at about this time every year, usually at about the exact same time after all the celebrations of the parades and pride fests, and after people have gotten accustomed to rainbows covering every store display and marketing material in sight, that I have a good natured person with the best of intentions come up to me and ask the question, why pride? Why is it necessary to celebrate pride every year? Several things go through my mind when I am asked this question. The first is to resist the urge to politely explain that, although I do identify as an openly queer minister, this does not mean that I am qualified in any way to offer up a definitive answer that speaks for the entirety of the LGBTQIA community. The second is to resist the equally strong urge to launch into a monologue that delves into the entire history of the queer rights movement, outlining the reality of what living conditions were like for queer people in the early half of the 20th century, and how they were subject to frequent instances of harassment, arrest, and brutality at the hands of police, how their names and addresses were submitted by the U.S. Postal Service to the FBI and local law enforcement, and how local papers would routinely publish the names of those individuals who were or were suspected to be homosexuals, which would often result in public shaming and the potential loss of their jobs. And how all of that came to a head at the Stonewall Inn in New York City in 1969, when during a routine raid and arrest by police culminated in a confrontation by patrons and others that were in attendance, many of whom were trans women of color, that eventually erupted into a full-scale riot that made national news. Sometimes I will still give an abridged version of this speech to people, although more often in recent years I will direct them to the Wikipedia page about the Stonewall riots because, after so many years, queer people become tired of the emotional labor that is required to constantly explain year after year to people why we should have a right to have our existence as a people respected by a civilized society, and how there is so much more that is interesting about us than simply our sexual orientation or gender identity. But this year, although I have yet to have anybody come up and ask me the question, I've decided to take a different approach. I have formulated a prepared answer to the question that I am ready to offer up if someone asks. If someone were to ask me why it is necessary to celebrate pride, my response is this. It is less about what you see at pride and more about being seen. To those outside of the queer community, that statement may seem a little bit conceited. And to be fair, it is to a certain extent. But the reality of living as a queer person in this country, both back then and today, is that it is all a game of optics. Living openly as a queer person means that you're making the decision to publicly take charge of the way the rest of society sees you. This is because you become all too aware as a queer person trying to exist in society that if you do not, society will develop a very clear idea of the person that you are and will assign that perception to you regardless of whether or not that is true. And often that depiction is less than flattering. You will be seen as confused or chemically imbalanced. You will most likely be branded as a promiscuous sexual deviant. You will be seen as someone who cannot be trusted in any role that involves taking care of or interacting with children. You will be seen as someone who drinks too much, does illegal drugs, and goes out partying every single night. Any attempts at trying to be respectable and create a life and a family for yourself will be seen as corrupting the hallowed heterosexual institutions of marriage and family. If you are a member of a community that is particularly religious, you will almost certainly be seen as someone who is an abomination in the eyes of God, and because of your choice of lifestyle, the only thing that you have to look forward to is a lifetime of hellfire and eternal damnation. And if you are a trans person, especially a trans woman of color, you are better off dead.
To be a queer person in society is a constant fight against this perception and to try to get people to see you for who you really are. In spite of the progress the queer rights movement has made over the years, there are still people who have been fighting for years to be seen as who they are and aware of the reality that any of that progress that has been achieved could be erased in a second with the signature of a pen or with a majority decision of the Supreme Court. We have all unfortunately seen what this is like on a collective scale with the recent decision to overturn Roe v. Wade and eliminate a long standing constitutional right for women's rights and women's bodily autonomy. Pride parades and pride celebrations are about emerging. Emerging from the margins that society has pushed you to and forcing the world and everyone else to truly see you front and center as someone who is proud of everything that they are. It is a moment of celebration, but it is also a moment of defiance. Being seen as our queer selves is a form of protest against everything society rejects. It is saying with our presence and our existence that we are here and that we are not going away, not anytime soon or ever. Those who may not understand or be able to relate with those in the queer community around the subject of pride have certainly had some experience over the past three years with the idea of emerging back into existence again. The global health crisis that has been the COVID-19 pandemic has gone from a request to stay at home for a few weeks to a massive change that has disrupted our lives in profound ways that none of us could have ever imagined. Especially for those of us who are extroverts or have active social lifestyles, we were all of a sudden met with the reality that even the simplest and most mundane of tasks that we did around people became risky and unsafe behavior. Everything from eating in a restaurant to going to the movies to traveling became dangerous. It not only put us in a potentially harmful situation, but ran the risk of causing super spreader events that could affect dozens of people. Even church was not safe. Although we lined up to get vaccinated and boosted as soon as we were eligible, many of us did get sick or knew people close to us that did. Some of us even had people that we were close to who lost their lives as a result of coronavirus. As much as advances in technology like Zoom and FaceTime became ways of finding connection in spite of the circumstances, being told to stay home and wait things out left many of us feeling more isolated than ever before. Even as the numbers of cases are going down and it becomes safer again to resume activities and regain a sense of what we have lost, it has given us an opportunity to consider our own emerging. What have we learned and what do we do differently this time around? For us in ministry, that means an opportunity to reimagine the future and try to foster a sense of connection for those that felt alienated and isolated during the pandemic. How do we manage the collective trauma that we have all experienced and how do we be there and provide pastoral care to our members, our friends? How do we come back in a way that is safe? And how do we come together to not only build the church back up, but imagine a new way forward for the future? How do we allow ourselves to be seen in a post-pandemic world? In Greek mythology, the phoenix was seen as an immortal bird that would periodically die in a show of flames and combustion before being reborn and arising from the ashes of its predecessor into a new version of itself that, in some versions of the myth, was even more beautiful than the one before it. In 2014, at the Eurovision Song Contest, a yearly event that is arguably more about the spectacle of the performances than it is about the music, and also one of my guilty pleasures, Austria, made the decision to send a drag performer, Conchita Wurst. The name of her song was Rise Like a Phoenix, which inspired the title for today's sermon. 
the performance was also noteworthy for its decided lack of spectacle. No dramatic light shows, no choreographed backup dancers, just Conchita standing on stage in a simple cream-colored evening gown, forcing you to see her and listening to her use her voice to sing a message of hope and resilience over adversity. You wouldn't know me at all today. From the fading light, I'll fly. Rise like a phoenix. Out of the ashes, seeking rather than vengeance, retribution. You were warned. Once I'm transformed, once I'm reborn, you know I will rise like a phoenix. How are we to rise like a phoenix out of the ashes, friends? What does our reemerging look like? How do we reimagine our lives, our churches, and our world again? How will we be seen? And how do we make ourselves into something even more magnificent than before, bringing everyone together in a sense of hope and resilience over the adversities of the past and make ourselves even more inclusive than before to those that we can bring out of the margins where they have resided for far too long? These are not answers that, alas, we will be able to solve by the end of a 15-minute sermon. They are yours to ponder in the months ahead. But if what I have to say counts for anything, I say that there is much to celebrate and that should be celebrated. It is a time for all of us to be seen and to lean into all of the potential that comes with what that means. May it ever continue to be so. Blessed be. Amen. Shalom. Assalamu alaikum. Namaste. Thank you all so much. Thank you for allowing me to be seen.